in this quiet, unassuming suburb in the west of London were conjured up some of the most individual and funny films ever made. Ealing has come to mean classic British cinema to audiences around the world. We play the game for the sake of the game. Other nations play the game for the sake of winning it. We're darling! Indubitably. Young men! Do you mind? <laughs> what I find very pleasant is that when I see the old films, and I'm very objective about them, but they are good and uh, they've lasted. Right of it, right of it. One went to work in the morning happily, you know, because you would li like the people that you're working for, you'd like the script, you'd like your director, you'd like the food. <laughs> Ealing was a very special place. It wasn't a studio which people rented out and came in and left and so on. Ealing was a home. I'll take 12. Very, very particular smell of the corridors there and um, slightly fusty and... and rather small and characteristic and kind of just seems to have bad plumbing and very English, you know. The movies are sly and dry. I hate that they rhyme, but they are. They're very sly and they're very dry. It's wit of an extremely refined, stylized level. <laughs> the whole idea of Ealing Studios is rebellion revolution of some sort, but very quiet, very gentle. Your mother married an Italian organ grinder. Ealing, I mean, we all have our roots in Ealing. I don't think there's no way you can escape it. The story of Ealing spans a hundred years and five distinct eras. There were spells under Basil Dean, Sir Michael Balkan and the BBC. Now new owners are intent on recreating the successes of the past. But it all began when Will Barker, a pioneer in film production, bought the West Lodge on Ealing Green in 1902. His first blockbuster was 60 Years a Queen, celebrating the life of Queen Victoria. Only a few seconds of film survive, showing the young Victoria being told of her accession to the throne. In 1915, Barker produced Jane Shaw, a story set in the Wars of the Roses starring Blanche Forsyth, Britain's first ever silent screen star. It was an epic production, as ambitious as D.W. Griffith's Birth of a Nation. The next milestone in the Ealing story came in 1928 when Basil Dean headed up a new partnership. Associated Talking Pictures invested heavily in three studios specially equipped to make films with sound. They were the first purpose-built talkie studios in Britain. I think not, sir. Is this a tablespoonful? Yes, sir. You sure? Quite, sir. I am you your confidence. Thank you, sir. Dean's films did not do well at the box office. With heavy loans to repay and the growing impact of the Depression, Ealing Studios were brought to the edge of bankruptcy. But then, a young lady from Rochdale strode out before the cameras. Gracie Fields saved Ealing Studios. The success of her films kept the studios alive and enabled Dean to scour the country for more talent. He found performers like Stanley Holloway. Hey, that were a good blowout, missus. Oh, right. Now you give me a blowout on those instruments of yours. Claude Halbert, the upper-class English twit. Hello? Yes, yes. Which department do you want, sir? Hold the line, I'll see if he's in. And a toothy young man with a taste for speed. George Formby. They were all to become stalwarts of the Ealing repertory. 
Then in 1938 came a historic moment for Ealing Studios. A new man took over. His arrival was to open the gates to a golden era. Michael Balkan, the son of immigrant parents, was already an experienced producer. He had discovered Hitchcock in the 1920s, and he was to turn Ealing Studios into a powerhouse for the production of films that were uniquely British. Hello there. By Jove, that was a party you gave the other evening. Wish we'd give a few like it to the embassy, what? Your Excellency is very kind. Done a lot for our prestige out here. We're the battleship. Johnny Goodshow. Well done. In 1922, Balkan had set up Gainsborough Studios, producing major successes like The 39 Steps. In 1936, he had become head of MGM British, but he found working for a big American corporation and Louis B. Mayer a miserable experience. I remember him saying, you know, I'd rather you know, run my own ship and sink with it if I have to than work for Louis B. Mayer. What's that? This is a cover from my disguises. I'll show you. King of Norway. The other way. <laughs> <laughs> and I always thought you were a keen musician. Well, I am. An early success for Balkan, still in the Dean mold, was Trouble Brewing. I can read the future and tell if fate's unkind. The stars I've read, I look ahead, and this is what I find. Climbing it starred George Formby and a newcomer to Ealing, Boogie Withers. George was sweet, but he was terrified of a poor man. He wasn't allowed to speak to any of his leading ladies who were all young girls. We were all sort of 19-year-olds, and that was the whole thing, that George always got the girl, you know. And, I mean, most of us wouldn't have looked twice at him. But his wife kept a very, very strict eye. I think she thought they were all after him. Oh, that was lovely. Will you play again for me sometime? Hey, any time you like. Good. Well, you know that that vat that we were supposed to drown, almost drown him? Ow! <laughs> well, we had to sit in that beer vat, which wasn't very big for quite a long time for lights and things like that. And um, there's very little room. So he sat down and I sat on his knee. <laughs> but nobody could see that because it was quite opaque, this stuff that looked like beer. And in those days, of course, we wore suspender belts. And there was this bit, you know, here, and there was always a tiny little bit of thigh. And by accident, George did it. <laughs> it's as if he touched a sort of an electric point or something as he shot in the air. And I don't like it. And then he started to giggle, you know, and I sat down again. I said, George, behave yourself. And he said, oh, if only Beryl knew. <laughs> When war broke out, Balkan believed British cinema had a vital role to play. He brought in an actor he had nurtured at Gainsborough, Will Hay. Hay's films gave British audiences something to laugh at in the dark days of the Blitz. Cutting up of an overshoot. Hey, if I didn't do this job, I'll do it my own time. Let go any <laughs> but Balkan's chief concern was for Ealing to make a serious contribution to Britain's war effort. He recruited documentary filmmakers, many of them from the respected Crown Film Unit, to bring a new realism to Ealing's war output. San Demetrio, London, was based on a true story of a badly damaged tanker, which the crew decides to reboard and sail onto the Clyde. The script was unusual because it used first-hand accounts from the sailors involved. The sort of movies that Mickey made at Ealing suddenly took on a reality and an, an ability to which the audience could uh, associate themselves as reality. They changed the style of British cinema. Somewhere. 
I always felt that um, uh, when I was invalided out, that what I could do, and if, if I could manage it, was to put the boys up there as they really were, with no false heroics and uh, there's a lot of nonsense talked about the stiff upper lip. I mean, they suffered like hell and they were scared to death but didn't show it. Right of it, right of it. Straight ahead. Michael Bork invited me to lunch and he said, would you like to come on to contract after the war? And I said, yes, please. And he gave me a contract with a retainer to help my mess board, which is very civilised of him. And that was that. Then I rejoined my battalion, took over a company and was taken prisoner. And uh, came back to England on VE Day to be greeted on the telephone by my wife who said, Eating Studios have been on, they've got a film for you. And I said, what is it? She said, well, it's the captive heart, it's a prisoner of war film and you've got to go back into prison camp in eight weeks' time. <laughs> <laughs> March to attention! Well, on the whole, it was a very genuine film, and, and uh, Basil Dillon's a very honest director, except one lapse about steel helmets. I said to him, uh, Basil, they didn't wear steel helmets all the time, they only wore them during air raids. He said, yes, but it looks so much more dramatic. <laughs> The Captive Heart was shot on location in a recently vacated prisoner of war camp, West Timke, in northern Germany. Gentlemen, we have discovered your tunnel. Since you have thus abused the amenities accorded to you, and pending reconsideration of the camp security measures, all these amenities will be removed until further notice. I've given instructions, therefore, to confiscate all books, writing material. The film music, did me a lot of good because we went on vacation to a prison war camp, and there were all those sort of bits and pieces left behind by the prisoners who'd gone home. And one day I went into one of the compounds where they weren't shooting, and I walked round and round and brainwashed myself into thinking I was still a prisoner. Then I walked out of the front gate of the camp. I really felt free for the first time. But humour was never far away at Ealing. And after the war, a new phrase would enter the English language, uh, hey, Ealing comedy. Two. Uh, just a moment, just a moment. Not to me, gentlemen. <clears throat> Not to me. Uh, to our beloved Fuhrer. Uh, you ready? Go. Dead of Night was the first Ealing film after the war. It is a compendium of horror stories, and it gave Balkan the chance to bring on some young directors. Dead of Night was the groundbreaking film of, quote, supernatural horror. And you had, uh, of course, the famous episode by, directed by Cavalcanti. I knew you wouldn't leave me, you'll go. I knew you'd come back. Not for long, my boy, not for long. You're going to stop in jail for years and years and years and years. But the one by Robert Hamer is probably the most powerful, I think, uh, the one with the mirror, where this uh, character sees events acted out in the mirror in the future. And uh, it's very interesting. There's a dark side there in Ealing, too. <laughs> The Cavalcanti one is amazing. The shot where the uh, the uh, ventriloquist dummy gets up in the jail cell and walks is really one of the great moments in cinema. A lot of it had to do with uh, this extraordinary community of people working together. Um, directors, editors, writers, actors, and, and Balkan at the head of all of this. The creative team was at the heart of Balkan's vision. All the staff were on salary, 
It gave them security and a sense that talent would be rewarded because all the promotions were made from within. I think it was a marvelous factory. It, <laughs> it ran, ran it like a factory and ran it very, very well indeed. Every month, Balkan held a meeting in the senior dining room for his top creative people. This was the famous Ealing Round Table. Ideas were discussed and problems shared. Discussions continued across the road in the Red Lion pub. A very closely knit unit, and we all used to get together in the evenings after work and have a drink in the pub, and uh, it was a great or camaraderie. Or two or three. There. <laughs> or two or three or four, and they were very uh, strong drinkers, I must say. It's a very funny thing to happen. They were all smoking in those days, and Angus dropped his cigarette on a little wire-haired terrier that a lady had brought into the bar. And we wondered where the smoldering and the smoke, and the smoke were all around the bar, and the publican got worried about it, and Angus saw the source and very calmly said in his lordly way, which he always spoke, he was about six foot five, excuse me, madam, but I think your dog is on fire. It Always Rains on Sunday was the second screen romance for Googie and John at Ealing. You look as if you need one. Thanks. All the best. All your wishes are. Off screen, their romance blossomed too, and John proposed. Prince all? Philip and Princess Elizabeth were going to get married, and it was on the radio, and I heard do you, Philip, uh, take Elizabeth for your wedded wife? And she said, I will. And the telephone went. And I picked up the telephone and he said, she's just said, I will, will you? <laughs> it was rather sweet. <laughs> it really was lovely. I said, yes, right, all right. I want to hear the rest of it. <laughs> I put up the telephone. So the, the rank boys put it in the paper, you know, the publicity boys. And there was a still from this film, it always raised on Sunday early on when I arrive and take Googie by surprise, my old girlfriend in the Nissan hut. Adam! It's all right. It's me. <laughs> it was this photograph, and absolutely unkempt, a murder on the run, you know, with clapped over and startled eyes. The latest picture of the happy couple. <laughs> <laughs> The film climaxes at the railway marshalling yards where Tommy, John McCallum, risks his life in a desperate attempt to escape the law. This famous scene was lit by Ealing's resident director of photography, Dougie Slocum. Marshalling yard, it's a lovely thing to light. Every cameraman knows that the, the real excitement is three-quarter backlight reflected by any metal surface, uh, like the wheels, the rails and so forth. We did most of this with arc lights uh, to their maximum effect to, to get this, uh, the nice glints everywhere and a nice sense of mystery and drama. We were shooting, I think, for about three weeks at nights, and nobody really liked shooting at nights, but we, we did anyway for about three weeks. Also, I remember it was freezing cold. It was, it was about February, uh, February, March. You did your own stunt in those days. You had very few stunt. There's another on the bloody rails. Yeah. And the train coming. No, I wouldn't do it again. It's too dangerous. Unlike so many of the other companies, which were motivated by their supposed judgments on the financial viability of the operation, Yes, of course, Mick had his views about that, but the important thing was the movie. Was the subject worth making? Did it have something to say? Was it of value to cinema? And was it subservient, in a way, to his devotion to British cinema? Wonderful to be free at last from problems so difficult for me to handle. Whatever lies ahead, I am now on my own ground. The idea of making a film about Captain Scott's renowned expedition to the Antarctic appealed to Michael Balkan. 
The story had many elements close to his heart, adventure, exploration, and a particularly British regard for the ill-fated hero. The problem always playing heroes was the fact that the relations were mostly alive and they always wanted the hero to be faultless, absolutely perfect, and of course they weren't. And I'm not forgetting the lessons of the past, but I want to take the new things as well. I shall take dogs, ponies, and motors. Well, I would take dogs, dogs, and dogs. There was a sort of element of, of criticism of Scott for his, some of his decisions, which was done in the film, and that didn't entirely please the Scott family. But it was true. I mean, he was a very splendid man, but he did have weaknesses. Captain Scott. Yes? Glad I caught you. I've come from India. Want to join your show, if you're happy. Good with horses. Who are you? My name's Oates. I wanted to play. I fought to a nail to get it. It kept saying I was a sort of good-looking young juvenile making love to girls all the time, and I said, well, I wanted to break that pattern. I consider myself to be an actor, not just a pretty boy. <laughs> when I was at school, Oates was one of our heroes. He, he was for most of my generation. I was born in 1920. <laughs> but my generation all thought that Oates was tremendously heroic. Well, they did it. I congratulate you, Titus. I thank you, Titus. A glacier tomorrow, Bill. The location of that kind certainly helped. I mean, you've got, you've got the feeling you realise what they've been through to... I mean, in a very minor way, we, we, we were very, very cold on the location. Scott, of course, walked on virgin snow, so we had to have virgin snow, and uh, he couldn't rehearse. And uh, Charlie Friend, who directed it uh, very well indeed, uh, said, now, Johnny, here you are, now there's a slope ahead of you, and uh, when you get to that brown patch in the snow, that's where you turn around and say that I'm all right, birdie, seems to be the best way up, OK? So I touched up with my... Four good men and true. Got to the spot, turned around and said, Birdie, better leave a flag here. Seems to be a good way up. Took one step forward and disappeared. Oh, and I walked on the snow bridge. And uh, if I hadn't had my harness on and harnessed to, to the other guys, I wouldn't be here today. It was um, very real. When Oates becomes too ill to carry on, he decides to sacrifice himself for the sake of the others. I hope I don't wake tomorrow, Bill. But Oates's famous last words presented more of a challenge than any of the physical hardships. I, I, I worried about it so much. And actually, Charles Friend did me a favour. He said, for God's sake, just say it. And I got quite cross with him, actually. I thought, my God, he's right, of course. Instead of making a heroic... Uh, thing of, of a big quote, you know, I just said it. I'm just going outside. I may be away some time. I think that's what Oates would have done. The last thing he wanted to do was to have them all rushing to restrain him. He just wanted to go quietly, quietly do it. There are some chaps in the water just there. Well, there's a U-boat just underneath them. Bearing 191, range 300. Attacking, stand by. There was one occasion during the filming of The Cruel Sea where, at a moment of great stress, Jack Hawkins cries. You're all right, sir. No. I don't mind telling you. I'm not. 
McBorkin was apparently very uneasy about this and felt that a British sailor, a captain, would never cry. So they reshot the scene with Hawkins not crying. It's perhaps worth saying that it was Hawkins' own reaction to the scene. It hadn't been in the script. And Borkin, to his credit, said, I see what you mean. The scene does need something. Perhaps he could cry just a little. So then he reshot it with Hawkins crying just a little. And finally, Mick capitulated and said, no, you were right the first time. Go with the original scene, which is what they did. It was my fault. I identified it as a submarine. If anyone murdered those men, I did. No one murdered them. It's the war. The whole bloody war. Now, here is a late item of news which has just come in. Urgent. All boys wanting a big adventure go immediately to Ballard's Wharf Shad Wolf. Where... Make it snappy! It was the comedies that would make Ealing films famous throughout the world. The first Ealing comedy, Hue and Cry, was shot a few months after the war ended. It was a comedy thriller about some boys who uncover a criminal gang. It was written by Ealing staff writer, Tibby Clark. We didn't attempt the impossible. I think our situations were just possible. I think the idea that excited me most of all was the idea for Passport to Pimlico. Are you implying that this treasure does not belong to the Crown? No, no. It belongs to the people in the area covered by the old estate. Since this charter specifically makes them natives of Burgundy. Do you mean that these Londoners are technically Burgundians? Indubitably. This royal charter has never been repealed. It is as valid today as on the day it was signed by the founder of the House of York. Blimey. I'm a foreigner. Balkan was a very, very patriotic man. And he said, of course, they'd be very excited and pleased at first. But he said, I think we should have something to show them that they're not satisfied to be the Gundians permanently. And uh, that gave rise to a, what turned out to be, I think, the best line in the film. You can't push English people around like sacks of potatoes. English? Don't you come that stuff, Jim Garland. We always were English and we always will be English. And it's just because we are English that we're sticking out for our right to be Burgundians. Yeah, right. So much of Britain lived in that sort of innocent atmosphere that Ealing was sort of shrouded. <laughs> they, they made films about innocence. I mean, actually, if you look at The Man in the White Suit, it's, they're very, very innocent caricatures of people. Radioactive thorium? What does he want that for? Even though it's about greed and corruption and lack of, you know, bureaucraticness and obstacles to progress, it's still taking place in a sort of nursery. Alec Guinness is a scientist trying to create a fabric that will never wear out. When, eventually, he is successful, the mill owners become worried about future profits and try to persuade him to suppress his discovery. But there's a wonderful moment when they're asking Joan Dreamer to go and seduce Alec Guinness to do what they want him to do. And, uh, in fact, her fiancé, Michael Goff, who is in love with her, has to eventually ask her to go and seduce some of this other man. Yes. Yes, I'm beginning to realise that. There's no need to explain what's at stake. When I tell you that we've already offered Stratton a quarter of a million, you can see for yourself. I can indeed. Since we're on the subject of price, what do I get out of it? Miss Brand, Daphne. The scene, curious stuff that I most remembered, because I must have been 11 when I saw it, was actually the scene where Joan Greenwood tries to seduce him, which, at the age I saw it, must have been a, it must have been a very startling, a sort of rather shocking scene. <laughs> You think she wants to seduce him, and then when he resists, she says, thank God you've resisted. <laughs> thank you, Sidney. What for? You said yes, I'd have strangled you. Now, we've got to get that suit to the newspapers. I think that's the key to them, is the characters are really grounded characters. You understand these people. They've got real lives. Um, they're going through their daily grind or whatever. 
and and whatever comes out of the, what the comedy that springs out is this inter reaction, especially when you get you know, you've got Guinness and the Lavender Hill mob as 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 this crushed little Clark with a, with a plan. Until my ship came home, I was obliged to live at the Balmoral Private Hotel in Lavender Hill. It's the fact that they're trying to escape from this crushing little world that they're all in. America, you know, is a broad place. You're not crushed like that. You've got all this space, so you can swing your arms around a lot. You, you can do many things, so the comedy is a different sort of comedy. This is boxes that hold people in, jobs that hold people in, things you have to do. I, I love the moment in Lavender Hill Mob when he gets his promotion. <laughs> reminded me of Brazil. Brazil is completely stolen from the Lavender Hill mob. Nobody knows that, and I just discovered it. It's shocking. He marches into one office, and then chief treasurer, that he joins the parade, and they march into another, and they keep marching up the offices. It's fantastic. And it's so, you know, concisely, economically done. I think that's, again, a crucial thing when you watch these films. They're incredibly economic. I mean, quite a few people would be willing to chance an arm for half a million. <laughs> yes. But how, uh, how would you get your gold across to the continent? Well, supposing one had the right sort of partner in the form of, uh, shall we say, Eiffel Tower paperweights. Oh, by Jove, Holland, it's a good job we are both honest men. It is indeed, Pendlebury. The Ealing work was very um, imaginative. I'm thinking of um, is it in the Lavender Hill mob where they run down the Eiffel Tower. It's very strikingly shot. It's a very impressive sequence. <laughs> The final touch to that sequence was given by Alec Guinness and Stanley Holloway. They surprised us by doing something that we hadn't anticipated. Uh, they must have decided themselves at the last minute, and that was when they appeared, they, they continued doing the circles that they uh, had done on the, on the spiral staircase. And this was a lovely touch uh, that just suddenly brought the whole thing together. <laughs> Another crime comedy, but in a different style altogether, was Kind Hearts and Coronets. It became one of Ealing's most celebrated films, and it tells the story of a gentleman serial killer. Kind Hearts and Coronets is one of my favorite films, and I, I love it because of its style and its, its, its wit and its elegance and just how outrageous it is. Um, it is dealing with murder and sex. It's, a, it's a, 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 a piece of poisoned chocolate in a beautiful box, beautifully wrapped box, because it really is just as, it's like, you know, Titus Andronicus or Hamlet. I mean, bodies are falling all over the place. A time to be born and a time to die. The occasion was interesting in that it provided me with my first sight of the desk coins or mess. Alec Guinness, of course, had been, had been cast, and the requirement was to try and find five actors who would bear some 
family resemblance to Alec Guinness. And they found this very, very difficult. And, you know, the makeup man, uh, Harry Frampton, was brought in, asked whether he could change people's faces uh, to look more more like each other. And he said, well, you know, you, you, you could go so far. Uh, Alec Guinness uh, was present while this conversation was taking place. And he suddenly sort of said, with a bit of a twinkle in his eye, why don't you let me play them all? Uh, you couldn't get a better family resemblance than that. And famously, that is what happened. The contract shows Alec Guinness being paid £6,000 for taking on all nine members of the Dascoigne family, who stand in the way of Louis Mazzini, played by Dennis Price, becoming the 10th Duke of Chalfont. There was the Duke. There was my employer, Lord Escoigne Dascoigne. There was Admiral Lord Horatio Dascoigne. There was General Lord Rufus Descoyne. There was Lady Agatha Descoyne. One felt that somewhere along the line, one should try and have one scene, if possible, showing all six characters together. One would normally have the laboratory put together all the different images that one had taken, and invariably gives a sort of very grainy, rather, rather grey effect. And I sort of felt that I didn't want, want the photography such as it was spoilt by, by that. So I elected to use a very old silent film technique of trying to do everything in the camera, meaning shooting the scene separately, rewinding the camera in between each scene. To do this, we had a large glass screen set up in front of the camera with a whole series of little squares of black paper covering the relevant areas of the screen. The thing was that it took at least two days to shoot the entire scene, because Alec Guinness took about three hours for the various makeups and wardrobe changes. If he fluffed a line, if he, he moved a little bit too much, any camera movement in the rewinding, and explored the whole lot, you'd have to start again. The life cut short was one rich in achievement and promise of service to humanity. The Descoynes certainly appear to have accorded with the tradition of the landed gentry and sent the fool of the family into the church. The sound of the words, the way the words are put together on the voiceover, it affected me so strongly uh, that um, uh, I must say there's no, no doubt there's a direct link to Goodfellas, a picture I made in 1990. Uh, of course, uh, Henry Hill, played by Ray Liotta, is not necessarily a gentleman. Your mother married an Italian organ grinder. Stand up. Huh? I said stand up. I will not tolerate hearing my mother's name on your coarse tongue. The sense of a film uh, a film being driven or, or having the voiceover having as much, as much of a, a place in the construction of the picture as the visual image. It was just an informal little house party. Our fellow guests were Lady Redpole and her daughter Maud, who most suitably resembled nothing so much as a Redpole cow and had a little more conversational ability. Did you go to the opera this season? No. The byplay between the dialogue and the picture is so smooth, it's so delightful how his narration, Dennis Price's narration, how sometimes it, it foreshadows what we're going to be seeing, sometimes what we're seeing is explaining what he's about to say or he did say, and sometimes you leave, I mean, it's wonderfully liquid, the way the narration and the picture come back and forth. The fact that we begin in the present, and then we mostly go to flashback, and then end in the present, um, it's, it's just a terrifically stylish and disciplined piece of work. Your Grace, I represent the magazine Titbits, by whom I'm commissioned to approach you for the publication rights of your memoirs. My memoir? My memoir. My memoir. My memoir.
After a brilliant innings, time eventually ran out for Balkans Ealing. Cinema audiences had begun to dwindle, and it was fitting perhaps that the new medium of television should take over. In 1956, the BBC made the studios the heart of film production for television. The BBC became the next sort of nursery of talent, you know, an enormous number of talented people, again, assembled under one premises, you know, in that rather sort of English way that it's kind of subsidised. So they say, all right, well, all, all of you lot can go into this pen and you can will allow you to play and will give you space to play in. And certainly when I was working at the BBC, we were very, very protected. You didn't have to make money for people. You didn't have to get particularly high ratings in, in, um, in those days. You had to do work that other people found interesting. You know, you'd turn up for work and Ken Loach would be down the corridor and whoever it was. And uh, uh, there was a very strong set of values and. A, and uh, they weren't the values that I'd grown up in. They were values that I really learnt and acquired by, not by talking particularly to these people, but by simply it being in the bricks and mortar at the time. You know, the, public, the values of public service that people sort of lament the passing of now. For 35 years at Ealing, some of Britain's finest television films were made. In 1991, Ealing Studios became too expensive even for the BBC to maintain and was sold on. Today, the new owners have ambitions to recreate the spirit of Ealing in the great days under Balkan. When we first started looking at the studio, we spent a lot of time talking about what the new studio should be, about completely reinventing the old studio model. But actually, the more we got into it and the more we analysed it, we realised actually that the old studio model works fantastically well. And it's, it's about fairly simple things. A location, a community, facilities so you can shoot something, ideas, finance and distribution. That is sort of the uh, ecosystem of movie making and they did it very well they did it very well in the hollywood studios and they did it very well here at ealing and i think that the key to all that is creating a home for talent my first kind of little tingle on the back of my neck came when that logo came up on the screen and uh, it, was, it was great fun to be doing something that bore that, you know, something I'd grown up with. Are your parents living? I have lost both my parents. To lose one parent, Mr. Worthing, may be regarded as a misfortune. To lose both looks like carelessness. The first film we've made that will go out under the Ealing banner is uh, The Importance of Being Earnest, uh, directed by Oliver Parker, which seems curiously appropriate, I think, uh, as, as a way of starting what we hope will be a, a new era. I don't think there's any chance of Gwendolyn becoming like her mother in about 150 years, do you, Alvin? My dear fellow, all women become like their mothers. That is their tragedy. A man does, and that's his. Is that clever? Well, it's perfectly phrased and about as true as any observation in civilised life should be. Ernest. It would be great for us to have um, more outlets in England to pr produce comedy, uh, comedy films about uh, English eccentricity. Perhaps the most eccentric film to come out of Ealing in its first century was The Lady Killers. It stands as a lasting tribute to the originality and wit of all the Ealing films. Right from the first shot, you know you're in kind of a magic world with Lady Killers, because there's a top shot looking down on the street with the terrace houses on the side and that odd little house at the end of it and the railway lines behind. I think it's a brilliant shot. It just says, here we are, folks. Get ready. Fetch the superintendent. Tell him it's Mrs. Wilberforce. Katie Johnson is breathtaking. 
I mean, it's the most wonderful performance because she never bats an eyelid, basically. She floats through it. There's, there's a real clarity about this woman. I love that her, vulner her vulnerability, and yet she's got steel inside, and whoop, and off she goes again. Miss Whipple, has there been anyone about the advertisement? It is done very heavy-handedly. Heavy the music is wonderful, because boom, the silhouette rises up, and, and this wonderful little Katie Johnson, this tiny little figure just floating through the world. <laughs> And the, the wake she leaves behind her is what's wonderful. But that looming figure, and then when that door opens, and boom, and there's, and there's Guinness there with the funny teeth and the, the weird hair and all that. And it, it's magical. Mrs. Wilberforce? Yes? I understand you have rooms to let. The colors are beautiful. The set's beautiful. It's, uh, um, I don't know, it, but it... I don't know why I accept that world also. You accept that all these people have gotten together and they, they're allowing this little old woman to dictate to them. A gang of ruthless criminals posing as a string ensemble rent a room from Mrs. Wilberforce, played by Katie Johnson. When she discovers their crime, the gang plans to murder her, but their efforts are constantly frustrated. Well, this scene when, when all of her friends come for tea, all those old women, it's fantastic and it's the woman in blue with a very silly hat who's always the last one who's got to be dragged away because she, she, she floats off screen no, no, no. Oh, i'm sorry but we must not oh, let them play louisa oh, i'm sorry they oh, will come in nice when we're having our concerts come here we will have to by and by now amelia if you don't mind they'll all we think she's got them all out because all we can see in the frame is it's clear of the little old ladies and then the camera shifts over and there's one more. I think you can learn everything you need to know about comedy, whether it's movement, whether it's dialogue, whether it's character, it's all in that film. As their attempts to kill the old lady are thwarted, the gang turn on each other. Finally, there is only one left. Lady Killers was of its time and for its time. But it stands for all time as a testament to the creativity of the quirky British studios that will be forever ealing. During the filming, Peter Sellers wrote his own trailer for the Lady Killers to entertain the cast and crew. This is the first time it has been heard in public. Once again, Ealing Studios, who gave you such great successes as Passport to Gold is Green, The Man in the Right Boots, now bring you their latest hilarious comedy, The Lady Killer. The Lady Killers tells of a ruthless gang of criminals headed by Alec Guinness, CBE, the man of a thousand faces. Remember Fagin? Herbert Long, direct from his great success as Anna in The King of Siam, plays Louis, the suave continental crook whose villainous past combines well with that of Major Courtney, a masterpiece of underplaying by Cecil Parker of Vista Vision fame. His partner in death is Peter Sellers of Radio's White Poons. Next comes Danny Green as One Round, the punch-drunk actor boxer, and introducing Katie Johnson as Mrs. Wilberforce the lovely little old landlady who in the end captivates the cold hearts of the lady killers.